President Trump's position was almost 180 degrees different less than a week ago. I don't think there's a, any appetite for massive U.S. military intervention in Syria. We are looking at the most significant humanitarian catastrophe uh, since the end of World War II. Hi, this is uh, Paul Salem from the Middle East Institute and welcome uh, to this edition of Vantage Point. I'm uh, very happy to have with me a good colleague and friend, Mona Yakubian, uh, to talk about issues of uh, refugees, internally displaced needs, humanitarian aid, stabilization aid, reconstruction, uh, particularly in Syria and Iraq, but uh, we'll mention sort of the Middle East more broadly. Uh, Mona is, uh, until very recently, was the Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Middle East Bureau at USAID, where she had responsibility for USAID work in Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. Uh, previous to that, uh, she was at the Stimson Center, a senior advisor working on issues relating to peace building. She was also heading the Lebanon Working Group there, and she's worked also previously at the U.S. Institute of Peace and uh, at the State Department's uh, Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Mona, thank you very much. Uh, nice to have me. you. Thanks for having me, Paul. Uh, uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about, as I mentioned, refugees, IDPs, mm. uh, their needs, what the international community is doing and what the U.S has been doing and might be doing. But uh, let's, let's pause for a moment with the developments, uh, the recent developments, the U.S. strikes in Syria, uh, and sort of more escalation. After three or four years of certain patterns of U.S. policy mm. in Syria, we seem to be uh, having a change. How do you view that development in general? Mm -hmm. And how do you view its potential impact on either escalating the war in Syria or de-escalating it? So it's still too early, I think, to tell exactly where it's going to take us. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the attack itself, this heinous attack in which more than 85 people, including women and children, were, ki were killed by what it appears to be sarin gas, mm -hmm. um, underscores really the horrific circumstances under which civilians are living in Syria, and it ties directly mm -hmm. to what we're going to be talking about, displacement and, and refugee flows. Um, in my opinion, uh, the strike that the U.S. undertook was essential mm -hmm. uh, in order to address this issue of the use of chemical weapons. What will happen next, though, I think is a big question. Well, let's pause there. I mean, mm. how much have chemical weapons... I mean, if you die by chemical weapons or die by a barrel bomb or something else, you know, you're, there's still a lot of, of death. Of course. How do you, given, you know, you're you know, working with refugees and IDPs and so on, how much were chemical weapons an issue in that? And if we only react when chemical weapons are used, mm. but it's okay to kill by other means, are we in a new place uh, regarding those issues? Well... I do think chemical weapons are treated differently, mm -hmm. um, understanding the, the, the level of, of, of civilian casualties in Syria, it's 400,000 mm -hmm. uh, at least, uh, is, is horrific. Uh, but there is an international norm that was established after World War I mm -hmm. regarding the use of or not to use chemical weapons in conflict. And this is why, this is what I think precipitated U.S. action. Mm -hmm. What we need to see going forward is, does it have a deterrent effect, number one? Number two, can the attack actually be leveraged to change the calculus of at least Russia, perhaps, mm -hmm. as the patron of the Syrian regime and do more to perhaps ultimately de-escalate the conflict by forcing the regime to, to the negotiating mm -hmm. table? Well, let me ask about that. I mean, you talked about the international norm which I think is international law as well in terms of not using chemical weapons. There was an emerging international norm of responsibility to protect, so-called R2P, mm -hmm. uh, which had some traction in Bosnia and a few other, other actions. Rwanda was a time when there was a lot of sort of agonizing about that, but it happened quicker. Uh, and the Obama administration sort of ended up not acting mm. uh, in protection of civilians. It acted in Libya, yes. but did not act in Syria. Do you see anything in President Trump's approach, his statements about kids and babies and so on, that goes beyond chemical weapons into a little bit of R2P? 
That I think is hard to know, mm -hmm. particularly since President Trump's position was almost 180 degrees different less than a week ago. That's true. <laughs> with respect to, yeah. to uh, the Assad regime mm -hmm. and almost an acquiescence that the regime is here to stay and the focus is countering uh, ISIS mm -hmm. in Syria. So I don't know um, uh, where we're going to go with this, although I don't think there is uh, any appetite for massive U.S. military mm -hmm. intervention in Syria. And nor do I think that's the right way to go. Mm -hmm. To my mind, what really needs to happen is we need to try to leverage these strikes as a way to de-escalate the conflict, to, be, to bring this conflict to a close mm -hmm. because of the horrific And, and to a close, you mean to an end or to de-escalate at least the bloodshed? Because there might be two different things. They may be. Um, and and it, it's hard to know. At a minimum, we have to de-escalate mm -hmm. the bloodshed because of the suffering, because mm -hmm. of the level of suffering that, that Syrians are experiencing and the destabilization, frankly, that has occurred in the region and, and well beyond, as mm. we both know. And we'll know. certainly get to that. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, let's step back now, and if you'd give us uh, and our listeners and viewers sort of a map of the extent of refugees, IDPs, yeah. Syria and Iraq, but a bit more broadly. What right. are the numbers, uh, and how do you, you know, what is the map, sort of? Sure. I mean, we are looking at the most significant humanitarian catastrophe mm -hmm. uh, since the end of World War II. If we look at, at the Syrian crisis alone, not to mention uh, the intertwining uh, conflict in Iraq as mm -hmm. well. What does that look like? It's five million Syrian refugees who Meaning have outside of the country. Outside of the country, yeah. about three million in in Turkey, registered. By the mm -hmm. way, these are registered mm -hmm. refugees. About three million in Turkey, um, 1.1, 1.2 million in Lebanon, mm -hmm. and about 650,000 in Jordan. Fewer numbers in Egypt and mm -hmm. Iraq. How much? How many got to Europe? Well. We know. And we've heard a lot. Yeah, of we've heard a yeah. lot of numbers. Um, the breakdown by nationality is is is, is hard to know. We mm -hmm. know that there were nearly a million, nine hundred thousand applications for asylum mm -hmm. last year. We remember this massive flow right. of refugees into Europe in twenty summer of twenty fifteen. Of that, of those nearly one million, um, the top three nationalities, as I understand it, are Syria. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan and I think it's Somalia. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Syrian, so they're clearly Syria is a big component. Of absolutely, it. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely, four hundred thousand. Absolutely, yeah. and and then there's been internal displacement mm -hmm. inside Syria. Another more than six million have been internally displaced. Mm -hmm. If you combine the number of refugees and internally displaced in Syria, it's nearly half the population, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is extraordinary. And add to that people who've died. Yes. Or people who've been injured, uh, you know. Exactly. Uh, it's just, it's, it's horrific. Exactly, which underscores the need to de-escalate. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the cost of well, this Well, this conflict yeah. obviously has been going on for a few years. You've given us sort of that horrific map. How has the international community or others so far, uh, you know, what are the needs and mm. how has the international community provided? Maybe for refugees who are outside of Syria, maybe mm -hmm. there's more access. But if you could describe, you know, whether it's the aid in Turkey, Jordan, mm -hmm. and Syria, mm -hmm. how are they, those refugees faring, and what is the nature of the aid? And, and secondly, though internally displaced, those six million, yeah. is any help getting to them? Yes. So the international community has responded with, frankly, the United States in the lead mm -hmm. as the largest single donor of humanitarian assistance. How much? Is it's roughly? over five billion uh, at wow. this point. Uh, yeah. in the since 2012 mm -hmm. um, and and so there has been a fairly significant response but it's never enough I mean mm -hmm. what we've seen over the last many years is chronic underfunding mm -hmm. of UN appeals um, and the appeals are um, themselves and they were growing and growing I think most recently there was a conference in in Brussels just a couple of days ago I believe mm -hmm. the appeal was was about five Five billion, but these to cover is that an annual kind of budget I believe appeal? to cover to cover the the humanitarian assistance. Yeah. They're For also a year. I is, believe. I, mean, yeah. I believe. Okay. But the 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 point is mm -hmm. more importantly, numbers aside, mm -hmm. there's no amount of humanitarian assistance that can. There, there's no no possibility to fully cover the needs using mm -hmm. human, humanitarian assistance. Um, what we've learned, I think, from the conflict in Syria and elsewhere, mm 
is that the humanitarian assistance architecture mm -hmm. as designed by the UN is really unfortunately outdated mm -hmm. and, and not sufficient to the task that we see, not just... What does that mean? I mean, well, the humanitarian it, assistance is what? Water, food, blankets, and tents? Yes, it's exactly. Roughly it's it's that, emergency uh, assistance. Mm -hmm. These are the first responders, if you will, uh, typically to a natural disaster, but mm -hmm. also in conflict, etc. I think what we're finding in a world that is, in, that is sort of marked by increasingly complex mm -hmm. uh, challenges and conflict and displacement. When we were in record displacement mm -hmm. this past year. About 66 million, I think, exactly. was the global figure. Exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's a broader sort of sense of disruption mm -hmm. globally. I mm -hmm. think the Middle East in many ways is at the forefront, but it's something that we're seeing much more broadly. What we're beginning to see is that these humanitarian budgets, particularly in the case of protracted conflicts, so Syria is now, the Syrian conflict is now in its seventh year. Mm -hmm. We're no longer in an emergency with mm -hmm. Syria. Mm -hmm. You can't simply food basket your way through this. Mm -hmm. And that's where um, the assistance community is looking to pioneer new ways in which we do a better job of bridging this sort of short-term humanitarian emergency assistance with longer-term development and assistance. How, what does that mean? I mean, take refugees in Lebanon, let's exactly. say. Exactly. Perfect example. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing with the refugees, there's a couple of characteristics that we should understand. Number mm -hmm. one, they are largely not in camps. 85% mm -hmm. of Syrian refugees are not in camps. In, in Lebanon? Or, in or Lebanon, in general. none of them are in formal camps. None of them are. They are, some of them are in, are in informal tented settlements that mm -hmm. you see, if you go to Lebanon, you see them mm -hmm. all around, certainly in the Bekaa and elsewhere. But they are large, so they're largely living in host communities. Mm -hmm. Well, that has a particular challenge to it. Um, Lebanon has the highest number of refugees per capita in the world. Mm -hmm. It would be the equivalent of anywhere between 60 and 80 million refugees descending on the United States and living in our communities. Yeah, for five, six years, for, for starters. Exactly. Yeah. And so what does that look like? Well, it's, it's all this, these services, mm -hmm. whether it's water or garbage collection or schools or medical health, all the so things. So is then the aid, let's take maybe Lebanon as an example, the international community trying to channel aid to sort of boost up the Lebanese governments and local authorities' ability to deliver standard services to people, you know, Th refugees right. are residents at this point. Well, in a way, in a way, yeah. but there, it's a little, as you know, it's a little mm. more complicated than that, right? Because they're certainly not residents. Mm. Their legal status, particularly in Lebanon, is very precarious. Mm -hmm. But the response has been is, has been several. There's been several ways in which the community, the international community, has responded. One is, of course, the the humanitarian assistance that we're talking about, mm -hmm. which there has been massive injections of humanitarian assistance to Lebanon which, by the way, has had um, an effect, it has sort of been a, an injection into the local economy mm -hmm. as well. So, for example, the World Food Program, which mm -hmm. provides the uh, huge food cash assistance for refugees to be able to buy food. Mm -hmm. They use e-cards that allow them to buy their food in Lebanese so that stores. So boost consumption, Ex boost the economy. I exactly. Yeah. It's been, I think, in, since 2012, I think the, mm -hmm. the number, the figure is, more than $700 million of mm -hmm. injection into the local economy. Um, so there's the humanitarian assistance. That's mm -hmm. one piece of How it. How is education handled in this Well, case? education has been Since a the kid, you know, yes. a lot of these people are you know, exactly. young kids who have been out of school or need, exactly. need schooling. It's been an enormous challenge for mm -hmm. Lebanon, as it is. Um, Jordan. And Jordan, less so, because mm -hmm. the numbers are a little bit less. Um, and there's a little bit more of, a, of, a, of an infrastructure, if you will, in mm -hmm. place there to be able to, to meet the needs. Uh, it's still an issue, but I think Lebanon is by far more glaring. Mm -hmm. So what, what has been the response in Lebanon to that? In, from the U.S. perspective, we, of course, provide development assistance to Lebanon, much of it in the education sector. So we began to reorient mm -hmm. our assistance in some ways to help meet the need. What did that look like? Um, rehabilitating and improving existing schools mm -hmm. is a start. Um, uh, providing psychosocial training to teachers to help mm -hmm. with students, Syrian students and others who are suffering trauma. Improving the curriculum so that we can improve retention. Um, the Lebanese have been quite generous by in opening their schools to Syrian students, but as you know, mm -hmm. the public education system in Lebanon, well before the Syrian conflict, 
um, was struggling mm -hmm. and was underfunded, in, underfunded yeah. and, and in need of a great deal of reform. Mm -hmm. So this has accelerated those efforts. Um, there are still many issues in terms of um, teachers' salaries. There you often have schools teaching uh, in, in double in shifts, shifts, exactly, and, yeah. and even three shifts sometimes. And there are deeper issues with the ways in which Syrian yeah. Yeah. children are being treated in schools. I think the biggest problem in Lebanon, though, that we're seeing is child labor. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're seeing such an issue with child labor is because of the difficulty that refugees have in order to work in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's the it's livelihoods, the ability to work that is the binding constraint that is inhibiting refugees from seeking and being able to get other types mm -hmm. of assistance. Mm -hmm. Let's shift to, I mean, the refugees who've made it out of the war zones in Syria might be the luckier ones, in a sense, mm. as compared to internally displaced inside Syria, and for that matter, maybe we'll get to it a little bit inside Iraq with mm -hmm. the battle for Mosul and so on. How does the international community, can it reach those people, particularly in Syria and Iraq? Obviously, there's right. relations with the government and with the Kurds and right. so on. But Syria is much more difficult. Six million internally displaced mm -hmm. in Syria. How does assistance get to them, if at all? Well, it's been, first of all, access, humanitarian access has been mm -hmm. an enormous problem in Syria because of the of the conflict and the rapidly shifting conflict lines, but also because of a, of a brutal tactic on mm -hmm. the part of the regime of besieging um, opposition-held areas. So mm -hmm. there's issues with besiegement that have been um, uh, really... And starvation. And starvation, and, uh, yeah. et cetera. Egregious. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, both the UN and international NGOs have found ways to reach every government of Syria with some amount of humanitarian mm. assistance. How? Well, I mean, there's in from regime-held mm -hmm. areas. Um, there, of course, is is access through the through regime the through the, through the regime to those so areas. Yeah. But there's also been cross-border, a fairly uh, rigorous cross-border uh, uh, regime in which there's assistance that's coming into Syria from both Turkey mm -hmm. and Jordan. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that assistance has more or less been able to flow relatively free freely, but it too is sometimes subject to the vagaries of the conflict, to, the, to issues that um, uh, either government might, either the Jordanian or the Turkish government may have with whatever's happening at that time mm -hmm. in the battle space. But that said, there, it, given, frankly, how difficult the conditions are on the ground, it is remarkable that there is an, a certain amount of humanitarian assistance that continues to reach people. Mm -hmm. um, that said, again, that's simply not enough. Mm -hmm. So one of the, one of the other, uh, I think, innovations that one's beginning to see, certainly at USAID, where I worked previously, is looking to build in what we call resilience programming. And what that's trying to do is help Syrians, who, by the way, would prefer to stay mm -hmm. in their country if they can, mm -hmm. if they're not subject to uh, heinous mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, chemical weapons attacks, etc. Yeah. If they can stay, that's the preference. Mm -hmm. So in areas where the conflict has receded, um, uh, USAID is working to um, bring together both humanitarian funding and development funding to do what's called resilience programming. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? It's doing things like helping to reinvigorate the agricultural sector, mm -hmm. which, by the way, also contributes to food security. Mm -hmm. It's revitalizing markets. So working in a way like local development exactly. with Exactly, very there. small scale, yeah. and doing it in ways that allow people basically to work, to feed themselves, and to stay there. Increasingly, as this, if this is able to continue, I think education mm -hmm. is becoming another priority for Syrian children. In this resilience uh, Exa trend. In this, in this resilience yeah. trend, yeah. because there are now, uh, I think it's one and three quarter million Syrian children out of mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. inside, inside Syria. Inside Syria. Inside yeah. Syria. This is from a, in a once middle income country yeah. with yeah. nearly 99% literacy. Well, in the, in the minutes remaining, and yes. we're sort of coming towards the end, I want to ask about two questions. One is the fallout of the crisis in Mosul or the battle in Mosul and the refu you know, the internally displaced uh, in Iraq. Obviously, there's some stuck inside Mosul. Yes. Get your views about that and how that might be addressed. Mm. And then end with uh, the U.S. administration, the new budget, impact on USAID, sure. and how you see that going forward. So, 
in the war for Mosul, uh, what's your sense of how many people are being displaced? Mm. Uh, how has aid been prepared for them? So um, the battle for Mosul, of mm. course, is the last great battle in the counter-ISIL campaign. And in Iraq. In yeah. Iraq, yeah, yes, nice. exactly, <laughs> exactly, yes, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Raqqa still to go mm -hmm. in, in Syria and elsewhere, but in Iraq, Mosul is sort of the last great campaign, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, Iraq is suffering from a significant crisis of internally displaced people. It's over three million, which is a mm -hmm. record number, some from the previous conflict, and then once ISIL came in, many mm -hmm. more uh, also displaced. Mosul, there were very dire predictions mm -hmm. of maybe up to a million displaced people. Um, but early on in the conflict, there was a decision made that the, those in Mosul should shelter in place. Mm -hmm. In part, I think, because it was unclear, th there was no way to sort of provide protected humanitarian corridors, if you will. Yeah. Exactly. And ISIS was preventing that There's, as best it could. And, yeah. and there had been a, some, some negative experiences mm -hmm. with that in other battles in, in, in Iraq, in, in Fallujah, for example, and, and Ramadi. So there was a decision, rightly or wrongly, for people to shelter in place. Mm -hmm. The current flow of IDPs, I think, is, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's far lower than was mm -hmm. expected. However, uh, what this means for Western Mosul, which is where the battle is now focused, which is the old city, mm -hmm. uh, narrow mm -hmm. roads, etc., is that there are estimates of 400,000 Iraqis sheltering in place mm -hmm. there. And they are basically stuck, and they are being used perhaps as human shields, um, it's very difficult to get any sort of humanitarian assistance into them. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a very, very difficult um, and critical period yeah. uh, the com in the coming weeks. Horrific. Let's end with uh, USAID. White House proposed a budget, yeah. a lot of cuts. That's not the budget. Maybe that will end up being passed. But I know you've written about that. Yeah. And uh, what are your... Well, I hope it's not the things? I hope it's yeah. not the budget that's passed because I think it really is a very short-sighted approach to the conflict that we're facing uh, against ISIL. And, and in more that broadly. budget that yes. was proposed, I mean, yes. we've heard figures about the State Department cutbacks, twenty-six or thirty percent. Yes. But was it clear what were the proposed cutbacks for USAID itself? The actual sort of line items, I think, are not yet have mm -hmm. not yet been completely negotiated and again who knows where it will end up sure. in terms of after after congress goes through but it was certainly it was certainly envisioning a large cut for mm -hmm. USAID and frankly under it, the 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 budget really i think underestimated the very important role that USAID plays mm -hmm. and our assistance plays more broadly and in fact what's interesting is the biggest proponents and advocates for AID mm -hmm. are our colleagues in the military mm -hmm. because they understand that the kinetic um, action only takes you so far. We've certainly learned this lesson in yeah. Iraq. Um, it's the stabilization work which mm -hmm. AID implements. It's working with people to get their, their communities back up on their feet, restoring essential services, building up local governance capacity. Um, some of the assistance, of course, also goes, as I had described, to helping Syrian refugees living in host communities in places like Lebanon and Jordan. Mm -hmm. That assistance has helped ideally keep those countries relatively stable. Relatively stable yeah. so, so a budget that cuts that kind of funding I think is remarkably short-sighted mm -hmm. and, and really doesn't serve U.S. national security. And do you feel interest. that in Congress there is, at least in Congress, understanding of that and maybe protection is. for it? I think there is. I think there is actually uh, across hear. the aisle uh, a very strong understanding and appreciation for mm -hmm. the good work that USAID does. And let's hope that comes through in the final we budget. We hope so indeed. Yes. Well, Monaya Kubian, thank you very much. Uh, Monaya Kubian, uh, former uh, uh, director at USAID for relief aid in Syria, uh, uh, Lebanon, Jordan. Uh, the, the Syrian refugees and so on. Thank you so much for being Thanks. with us today and explaining these issues. Uh, this has been Vantage Point from the Middle East Institute. See you next time.